Okay, so hi again, and uh, one thing I want to do um, is I want to supplement where I can and where it applies uh, what I just taught as it relates to the guitar, because I know some of my viewers are guitar players and want to get the sense of this in a practical way on the instrument itself. So uh, we're going to discuss intervals for a guitar. All right, let's start at the top. I don't need these headphones, so... Let's start at the top. I'm um, going to adjust this though, so we get the neck of the guitar in. Okay, we're good. All right, the top is, we talked about seconds. Now, if we do seconds on one string from B to C, well, you can see they're right next door, and there's no note in between the two notes. So that means uh, it's, a, it's a half step which is also known as a minor second. Now here's one, one of the many reasons why guitar is so counterintuitive. If I did that B to C interval between two strings, it would look like they're a far distance away. For example, here's B, here's C. Look at how my hand is stretching to get those notes. Oh my god, that's the devil horns. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so that's why guitar is counterintuitive, because it, it's not visually, it doesn't make sense when you visually look at it, and they're supposed to be right next door to each other, and they look so far apart. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the nature of all stringed instruments, they do that. There's a lot of redundancy on, on stringed instruments. Uh, give you a quick example. On a piano, if you do a G scale in one octave, okay, uh, you'll find it in one place. I mean, that's the only place on a piano you can play that one octave scale. Now watch this. I'm going to do a G major scale in one octave and show how many ways you can play it on guitar. insane okay when you think of like well uh, when you're improvising which of those shapes do you use I mean it could really drive you nuts when I teach guitar I teach something called neighborhood playing so if you need to switch scales or anything like that you can do it all in one space so you don't have to move or jump around the neck to go to different scales perhaps in the future I'll get into that not right now uh, because we're talking about intervals okay so um, we just did the minor second on one string which is very apparently visible. And by the way, if you want to gauge anything like intervals or the intervals in a triad, if you do it on one string, it becomes like the piano. In, in other words, you can very clearly see the distances the way you would on a piano. Um, and this half step is, that's proof. I mean, a minor second is just a half step away. So, that. Uh, then we have the uh, m uh, major second. Uh, let's go A to B. And notice, right here on my middle finger is tapping, that's the note in between, which is one whole step. And again, we have the same phenomenon. If I go between two strings, A to B, I have to do a stretch to do it. That sound is a skateboarder, all right? It sounds like a 747 going through the alleyway. It's amazing. There's a parking garage across the way from me, and it acts like a reverb chamber and just reflects the sound. It's really great for getting sleep late at night when these skateboarders go by. Also, what's really nice is when the big garbage trucks are right under my window. I love that. Life in the urban world. Okay, so, continuing on. So, we just covered the seconds. And, by the way, you know, I talked about inverting intervals. We'll do that in a moment. But first, I want to get to each category. The major third on one... Uh, the minor third on one string would be a step and a half. You might recognize this from the pentatonic shape. If we were to gauge this in intervals, we got a minor third there, whole step. Uh, that's a major second, minor third, and I'm going to show you that major second, minor third, major second, whole step, minor third, whole step, minor third. Okay. You see how quickly I could do this? You should train yourself to do this. You may not think it's important, but once you understand the structure of scales and chords and things like that, the more you're able to visualize this and process this quickly through visualization, not through words in your head, 
through visualizing it, you'll be able to really move through the more jazz type situations where you do have to modulate um, and go through two fives, which are two five is, is something we were taught in jazz school. Two five moves you to a different key. We'll talk about that. Don't worry about it. That's on Mount Everest, though. So let's just stay with this right now. All right. Uh, so we have the ma minor third. And uh, for guitar players, I'd say this: when you move between two strings, let me move up here. So that's A to C. That's a minor third. A to C between two strings is this shape. Now, memorize that shape. That's important. Any any interval you could get between two strings, you should memorize. And in fact, even skipping strings like uh, well I can't do it with a with a minor third I'll get to it later when we get to uh, six and sevenths all right so major third all right this is the first part of a major chord a major um, major third there's the root there's a third and if I were to go to the fifth it's a minor third the a major chord okay so, uh, major third, again, this should be memorized between two strings, is this distance. And by the way, when you go up the scale in harmony, like harmonizing thirds, you're going to encounter, by, by the nature of the shape of the scale, you're going to encounter both major thirds and minor thirds as you travel. I just showed you the minor third, and here's the major third. Now, I'll do an A major scale harmonized in thirds. Watch as you'll see this interval and this interval. Okay, so uh, major thirds and minor thirds combine to create uh, the harmonized scale. Okay. This will become important later on down the line when I discuss blues and chromaticism. A uh, really wild thing happens with seventh chords where you can really do strings of chromatic notes and it sounds cool. Uh, all right, so that would be uh, the major third. Now we have the perfect fourth, and this is also very important in overall guitar. Why? Because the distance between the E string and the A string, perfect fourth. A and D string, perfect fourth. And you know from, if you learn basic tuning without using an app, but manually tuning the guitar, uh, E, F, G, A, there's the A note, and then you tune it to the A string. All right, I always tell my students, the fifth fret in general is very important on guitar. Um, I make them memorize permanently. If they can't remember any of the other notes on the neck, memorize permanently that that's an A note. All right, uh, maybe I'll get into that in the future, like specific guitar teaching. All right, anyways, uh, so perfect fourth, right, is the distance between the E and the A string, the A and the D string, the D and the G string, and the B and the E string. And you might notice I skipped the G to B string. It doesn't sound like a fourth, does it? It's singing. Right? If I was doing fourths like that, it would sound like this. It's... Sing-songy as okay. So again, remember that sing-song equality of thirds and flip thirds, which are sixths. Okay. All right. Now, so one thing you could see is that if you bar any two strings, the E uh, at the third fret, I'm barring G to C. If I were to count up the G scale, I go one, two, three, four, and that's whole step, whole step, half step, two and a half steps is a perfect fourth. You get perfect force when you bar between two strings except for the G and the B. Now, uh, let's discuss that for a second. If I do this, how, how come I don't get a perfect fourth? Well, you have to remember, when you go through manual tuning, when you get to the G string, you go to the fourth fret, not the fifth, right? Well, that lowers the B string, so you have to compensate up the note. So instead of doing uh, this to get a fourth, like barring, I have to bring the B note up one, and now I get a perfect fourth, okay? And uh, let's go down here and do that. See that? Well, if we do a D chord, you can see the perfect fourth inside the D chord and the major third on top. And by the way, here's, that's the sixth. Hang 
on a second, there's a maniac in the alley. No, it's not a maniac, it's just people laughing it up. Venice is a party. You, you gotta come here, it's an awesome place. I love Venice. It's total. thank you. It's totally cool place to live, it really is. It's, if you're anything like the bohemian, artsy type, this is a mecca for those people. And of course, you get a ton of insane people because of this, but what are you gonna do? All right, anyway, uh, so perfect force. Right? Notice that hollow sound, what I mentioned about uh, the um, Gregorian chant sound. Uh, right? We also get that hollow sound out of fifths, and why? Because a fifth is an inverted fourth. All right, we're going to skip the tritone interval for now, which stands between perfect fourth and perfect fifth, because that's a category all its own, and it's very special, as I mentioned. All right, so we could see the perfect fourth intervals by going between strings. Now, another interval you should recognize and know is the fifth. Now, again, I count up the G scale, one, two, three, four, five. We get five steps, and it's whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, three and a half steps to get a fifth. This is important because, uh, hang on a second, I, I have to pause this because uh, they're making Great, now I have my windows closed and it's super hot outside so I'm baking right now. See the trouble I go through to teach you stuff? Anyway, um, again that's the fifth and we have the same phenomenon between any two strings except G to B, but do that hollow sound? between the D and G string. Now when we go to the B string, the G to B string, remember I have to compensate up one step. I can't make this shape, I have to make this shape. And finally we go back to the old power chord shape. Now I just said power chord. For guitar players I want to talk about the evolution of the power chord. It's kind of a D evolution, not an evolution. Not that I have a judgment against it, power chords are way cool, but I'm just saying it kind of uh, oversimplified a situation. When you take um, the major bar chord form, hear that hollow sound? That Now if I were to just take those three notes, we'd get that Gregorian chant. But we also get... Anyway, so that's the power chord sound. I will say just a quick remark is that in the 90s, uh, the metal guys and some of the, what they called alternative rock at the time, were tuning their E string down to D. And what that does is it creates a set of fourth between the, instead of creating a fourth between the E and A string, well, the E is now a D string. So it creates a fifth, D, E, F, G, A. One, two, three, four, five. All right? And now if you do what was once the fourth shape, now it becomes the fifth. And in a lot of that metal style, you can hear that growl because the E string is so deep and low. Some guys go so far as to tune their E string, um, well, they, they tune normally except a whole step lower. So. Uh, basically you tune your E down to D and then follow the manual tuning steps and get it all tuned in that sense then they lower that D note down to C and that's really growling it kinda has a dark satany sound that doesn't particularly turn me on but there are a lot of guys that like that sound and you know God bless you whatever it's all good remember music is benign it's not gonna hurt you okay so if somebody does make some music that's uh, you know hard for some people to bear, there are other people that like it. So, there's an old saying, there's no accounting for taste, and you can bet that's true, okay? Myself, I'm, I'm very, very sensitive. I have a, a high-strung nervous system. I'm skinny as a rail, and I'm very, very sensitive. So, like, I like more delicate types of tones. I don't like jarring stuff, because literally my nervous system will jump if something is too jarring. People that are more physical and athletic and active tend to like the heavier sounds, they, you know, they, they're not as, they're, they don't have such an overexposed nervous system the way I, I do. And that's part of the reason why some people like uh, certain music over others. It's just a matter of how thick is your skin, you know, how much can you handle. 
All right, so anyway, um, I didn't expect this to go on this long, but I'll, I'll continue. I'm having fun now. All right, now, um, all right, we talked about fifths. Now, now we start getting into inverted intervals. As soon as we get past the, uh, uh, past the tritone interval, which is the, either called the augmented fourth, the diminished fifth, or the tritone, all three words cover the same sound. And I'll get to that. But, um, now, let's talk about inver inverting intervals. You'll notice when I do... Oh, I was talking about the de-evolution of bar chords. Let's stay with that. All right, so we have this, this hollow sound. Now, what we have from here to here is a perfect fifth. And if you've been listening to me, when I go from here to here, I get a perfect fourth. Well, that's G to D and back to G again. So G to D, when the G, when the G comes from below, it's a perfect fifth. But when the G is put above the D, it becomes a perfect fourth. That's an inverted interval. That's inverting intervals. Very simple idea. Don't overthink any of the stuff I teach you. Take it on face value. The important thing is to understand it first intellectually. And again, don't overthink it, because a lot of people have a habit of over-applying music theory, and, and they go past themselves, and then they get lost. So just take everything at face value. But the important thing is do it on your instrument. All right. If you play piano, look for fourths, look for major thirds, look for minor thirds, fifths, all these intervals. Get to know them. Play big chords and, and check out the intervals between the uh, chords, between the notes. Check out the outside intervals from the root of the chord to the uh, final note of the chord, which may be a seventh, a ninth, whatever. All right. And check out that interval. Get to know what these shapes look like on your instrument. All right. So we know now that when we invert a fifth, we get a fourth, or better said, when we invert a fourth, we get a fifth, right? All right, now, a sixth is an inverted third, and there's a formula for uh, de determining is it a minor six or a major six, and you could do this with any interval except for the perfects and the uh, tritone interval. What you do is, um, if you're inverting, say, let's use the example major third, okay? If you invert it, uh, it becomes what's called a minor six. So what you do is you take the quality major and you turn it into minor, and then you take the number nine and subtract that uh, the, the three from the nine. In other words, we're talking about major thirds, so we attract three from nine, gives us six, and we take major and turn it into minor, we get minor six. I hope that makes sense. So now, here I have G to B. The sing-songy one. That's the most sing-songy interval is the third and the sixth. All right. Now, if I take this G, this G note over here, and put it in the high octave, okay. This is a situation. As a guitar player, you should learn. Uh, we're going to go to the modes later. You should learn to do this in all seven modes, but I'll play a major scale for you. And again, we're going to find two shapes, major shapes and minor shapes. So here we go. And there's plenty of songs that came out of the 60s. In fact, I was, uh, I'm friends, well, he's passed away, rest in peace, but I, I was friends with the guy who was the pioneer of six on guitar when he was a session man in New York for Bob Dylan. Okay, so that's six. It's a really cool sound, and you can learn to improvise with them. Uh, now, we move on to sevenths, and I said in my prior video, the non-guitar one, sevenths are not sing-songy, and they don't correspond to any of the major or minor triads. You'll never find a seventh, no matter how you invert the intervals or invert the chord itself, you'll never find a seventh in there. It seems that the triad, there's something iconic uh, and important about the triad. It's a triangle, and uh, you know anything less than three notes does not comprise a chord anymore. So technically, power chords are not technically chords. They call them fives. Like, you take the root G, add to the fifth, and they call this G5. That's the way they describe it. There's no other way to describe it. It just is. So, just so you know that. Okay. Um, 
And you notice with six, there's two shapes, because there's two shapes when you do the thirds, okay? Now we're going to move on to sevens. All right, so uh, G scale, four, five, six, seven, again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if I put the G, I get that sound. Now, sound was actually, I can't think of the name of the song, in the 90s a lot of guys were using this major 7 sound, but if you do an entire scale with major 7s and minor 7s, it sounds not sing-songy, however, as a separate entity, it sounds kind of cool. Alright, now, so let me do the scale in minor and major 7s. so pardon me for not knowing it perfectly. Uh, this is why I tell people, please do not consider me an authority. I have, I have a bunch of stupid things that I do in music all the time, and it just happens to happen. All right, um, anyway, let's continue on. So we have the sevenths, and then there's something called the unison. If I play, when I tune a guitar, this A and this A are called a unison, and they're called a perfect unison. And uh, if I do an octave, which you should know about, you go, how you find an octave is go up two steps and then down two strings. So that's an octave right there. And in fact, if, if you don't know like the ins and outs of the guitar neck very well, this is what I always teach my students. The E and the A strings are by far the most important. What I would say is Learn the E string, the A string, and the B string, and I'll tell you why now. Uh, when you, first of all, also, not just learn those strings, but make it even easier. No sharps, no flats, only the natural notes. If you remember that between E and F and B and C is a half step, you could find any note on any string. If we think of the open string as being, if we think as this, of this as being a fret, from here to here, is a half step, there's no note in between. So that's the E string going a half step up to F. The rest are whole steps until we reach B, C. So this is F, this must be G, A, B, and then we get our half step C. All right, why do I say just the natural notes? Because if you know where A is, you know where A sharp is, and you know where A flat is. If you know A really well, you can also know where B is and, and where G is, a whole step below and a whole step above. Now. The reason I say the e a, uh, e, a, and B strings are this. Uh, if I know where this A is, if I use this visual, up two frets, down two strings, right? If I know where this A is, I know where this A is on the D string. The same phenomenon happens on the A string. This is a D note. If I go up two frets and down two strings, these are both D. So if I can picture this D, it's very easy to picture this D over here. And so by way of, by virtue of getting the E and A strings, you're now getting also the uh, uh, D and G strings. The high E string, of course, is the same as low E string, so where there's an F here, there's going to be an F here. Where there's G here, there's going to be a G there. So you don't have to worry about the, the redundant E string. The B string is the only one that I'd say get to know that. In fact, I've had bass players that wanted to learn guitar, and uh, there, of course there's no B string on a bass. That's the one that screws them up. So get to know your B string natural notes. Uh, all right, now let's look at a bar chord in terms of intervals. So the first two strings, that's a perfect fifth. Remember the power chord shape. Then the next two, that's a perfect fourth. You remember you could bar that. Now this shape is a major third. This shape is a minor third. Remember I said the uh, major chord consists of a major third and a minor third. And by the way, if uh, this weird thing about music is it's asymmetrical. So uh, if I did major third, major third, I would get the obtuse augmented sound. Which is a beautiful chord. It was 
was used a lot in, in early Beatles music, but it's not the kind of chord you could vamp on. You can't go and sing a nice melody over it. It's kind of weird. It's obtuse. What it is is a transition chord. G major, G augmented, C. All right? So the augmented chord, by the way, is major third, major third. Okay? All right, so getting back, uh, the G to B is a minor third, as I said, and then we have this shape. What's that? Perfect. Fourth? Good, you got it. Okay? And also you can look at a chord uh, by skipping strings. Here's an octave. Here's a sixth. Uh, from G to G on the D string is an octave. From D to B, A string and G string is a, a minor, uh, major sixth. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it's a major sixth. And then uh, from G to D, as I skip the strings, that's a perfect fifth. We didn't talk about skipping strings to make these intervals. A little bit of experimentation will give you that, but you should know how to do that too. Okay. And uh, finally, the uh, G to E string. That is a uh, minor six interval. All contained within this one bar chord. Okay. Now. One thing, I, before I go, I just want to point out one thing. We talk about triads as comprised of three notes, but we have six strings on a guitar, so how is the C chord? I'm playing six notes. How could it be a three-note chord? Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. And not to be redundant, I just want to say redundancy again. Okay, now, the C chord is comprised of C, E, and G. Remember that as I go down the strings. G, C, E, G, C, E. All C's, E's, and G's. What you're, what you're getting are repetitive octaves in higher and lower registers. So that's uh, basically why you play six strings, but you're playing a triad, a three-note chord. All right, I hope all that makes sense. I gave you some extra stuff besides intervals. That's the way I teach. I kind of go on these side trips. So I hope you got something out of it. That's the most important thing to me is that you understood it. And I'm very, very happy to be doing this for you. Uh, take care and have a good day, night, or morning. Bye-bye.